All right, everybody, welcome to today's video here. In this video, we're gonna be talking about the stack. And so hopefully this is a partial review um, from your assembly course. And uh, for those that haven't maybe taken assembly or it's been a while, maybe a, a really good refresher. Um, also hope that we start to learn some new things about the stack. And, and definitely we get into some of the security features like the stack cookie that helps to mitigate overflows and mitigate that potential for uh, what's considered memory corruption and, and ultimately exploitation. So we'll talk about that here as we go. Before we get into it though, we gotta just talk a little bit about memory layout. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more detail here later on in the semester about the virtual memory and paging and how all that works. Um, for right now though, what we have to understand is that when a program is loaded into memory, it's given a series of addresses. Those addresses are important because those addresses are how we reference data. That's how the CPU knows where to grab instructions and execute those instructions. When, when generally we're talking about the memory address, the memory space, the memory layout of a program, uh, you'll see, at least for me, that I like to do it in this way, and that we have higher addresses up here and lower addresses right here, and that this block generally represents those addresses, the address space for a program. Those higher addresses, okay, where we've been talking about things in a 32-bit world. So keep in mind that we're still talking 32-bit. And with that, then those addresses, think about pointers when you learned about pointers, because that's really what we're talking about. Um, they generally start with the highest address. Okay, so FF, 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 right? Um, a hex digit, so one of these is four bits, that's a nibble. Two of those is eight bits or one byte. Okay, we have four of those, four groups of two, so this equals four bytes or 32 bits. Okay, the lowest address is just a zero. All right, so I could draw all, all seven, the rest of the seven zeros, but I don't need to do that. Okay, so higher addresses, lower addresses. As we reference things from a higher address to a lower address, we decrement, we decrease. If we go the opposite direction, we go from a lower address to a higher. Now, how all this memory is broken down then is that that program is mapped into memory and then certain sections, certain addresses are used for specific things. Certain areas are gonna be used for data, certain things are gonna be used for code. We have constructs like the heap and the stack in which we're gonna use in the program. Um, not necessarily always in this order, but again, what we're gonna focus on here is the stack. Uh, and we can see that in memory, most implementations will have the stack growing down and the heap growing up. Okay, The heap we use for dynamic memory allocation. So things like malloc is what we use the heap for. Uh, the stack, we generally reference less directly uh, and that we're using it for local variables, we're using it to pass arguments to functions, and it's really essential for the overall flow of our program, and we'll go through that today. So the stack grows, and when the stack grows, as it gets bigger, the addresses is actually decreasing because we're going from an area where we have higher addresses to an area where we have lower addresses. And so keep that in mind. Uh, the stack grows down, if you ever hear somebody say that, that's because the stack is growing to a lower address. Okay, so what happens? So let's talk through some of the concepts and then we'll go through some diagrams here. So what happens when a, when a call is executed? So we're looking at the instruction, you know, thinking about this in assembly, the call instruction. What happens when that call is, was, is executed? Well, a couple of things happen. One, the address of the next instruction is pushed onto the stack. So when that function returns, it knows where to return to. So if we have Let's say we have call foo, and then we have add ESP, whatever, you know, some, some numeric value there. The call instruction pushes onto the stack the address so that it knows to return here, and then it also moves or sets EIP to the address that represents this function, right? Because this is a label. All this represents is an address in memory. So that EIP, our instruction pointer, knows where in all of this layout of that program, where does that function exist? So it can go to that address 
and start executing instructions. Okay, uh, when return is executed, what happens? Well, we need to make sure that the stack is taken care of properly because what's going to happen when a function returns is that the address of the next instruction is popped off the stack. So this address right here that was popped on, pushed on from this call instruction, that's going to get popped off, moves into EIP, and now EIP is going to start executing instructions there. And so uh, that's the general flow uh, of, of executing instruction, the call instruction and how the stack is utilized for that. Um, within the stack itself, we typically talk about two registers uh, when we're dealing with the stack, talking about the stack explicitly. You can see EBP is one and ESP is another. So EBP is the base pointer, the extended base pointer in the 32-bit world. If we were talking 64-bit, we would just replace that E with an R, and that would become RBP. So if you look at any code and you see R's instead of E's, you're, you're just looking at the 64-bit equivalences. Um, that's the base of the function. And so we have this process of setting a prolog, of a setting the, the, the stack frame for a particular function. And what you're going to see happen is that we're going to save the old value of EBP. This will be one instruction. We'll see that here and we take a look at the code in just a moment. Then we're going to set EBP to point to ESP. And what that essentially does is it makes EBP become the new frame for the stack. The benefit to this, and you're going to see this in Ida a lot, you're going to see this in a lot of the programs that we're disassembling and reversing, uh, is that you'll see a lot of you know, instructions that are EBP plus and then some, some offset. And what we're doing here is that if we have all this, this space, let's say that this you know, box represents memory on the stack, and we've got local variables, right? maybe we have in A, B, C, D, this is A, this is B, this is C, and this is D, EBP plus four, Right. If EBP is the base of our stack, and it's pointing right here, well then EBP plus 4 would point right here. Right. We'll get more into the local variables here. I'm going to make that a second lecture, but just to give you an idea of where we're going. Um, so that's how we're referencing those. And so ESP is going to be pointing to the top of our stack. If this is the top, and this is the bottom, then the benefit to this is that while ESP grows, as, it, as we change our stack, as our stack grows through the execution of our program, or execution of a program, EBP can remain constant. If ESP grows by maybe you know eight bytes, so now it's pointing down here, EBP can remain the same. And we can still reference these local variables, A, B, C, and D, based off of consistent offsets. And so that's, oops, that's what this benefit is saying right here, is that it becomes a little bit more consistent when we're dealing with these locations on the stack. And we'll talk again, we'll talk about locals in particular in the next video. Alright, here's our prologue, here's our epilogue. So we want to be able to understand not only what these are, but also that once we understand, we can recognize those in the functions, we don't have to spend any time analyzing it. And so we looked at that in the lab one review. There's our prologue, there's our epilogue. We know what it does. We don't really need to worry about it because we understand it. Um, two steps. Talked about that in the last slide there. Step one, this push EBP. So that saves the old value of EBP. Okay, we're going to use that register. Next instruction, we're going to move into EBP. So we're saving it so that we can restore it when we're done. That's what we're doing here. Next thing we do is we move ESP into EBP. Okay, what is ESP? At that point in time, that's the top of the stack. Right? And so before we do anything inside the function, this is the beginning of a function. So it's before we do anything inside of a function, before we allocate space for locals, before we do anything, we're, we're saying, okay, we're about to begin. Let's save the address that is currently the top of the stack and move it into EVP. Okay, then we have code, all that code comes in between um, the, the prologue and the epilogue. The epilogue, it's everything ready to return. And so what it does is it's gonna move the value of EBP back into ESP. Okay, and what was that? Well, EBP is the top of the stack, 
right before we start executing any code in this function. So we're moving ESP, regardless where ESP is pointing, um, we're, we're moving the old top of the stack value back into ESP. We're restoring EBP, right? We had a push here, so now we need a pop here. And then there'll be a return. And the return will pop what's on top of the stack, which should be the return address, so that it knows, the CPU knows where to go next. Okay, so uh, let's try to go through an example here, and you'll see that there is some you know, partial uh, bits of a program here, at least the parts that are necessary or important in order to go through the stack. This will represent the layout, the, the memory layout of the stack here. So we'll have higher addresses to lower addresses. So our stack's gonna grow down. Each one of these blocks is gonna represent four bytes. They'll be four bytes wide. And so typically we push, we push four bytes at a time, um, pop four bytes at a time, and generally deal with memory in four byte chunks. And so you'll see that here represented for the stack. Uh, we have EIP. Okay, and if you recall, EIP is our instruction pointer. And what EIP does, the job of that register is to have the address for the next instruction to execute. And so as we're going through these line by line, EIP is keeping track of where execution should flow for the program. The other two that are important right now will be EBP and ESP. Okay, EBP Let's say that we're gonna start right here. Okay, we'll execute this first instruction. Um, EBP's pointing off somewhere. We don't really care, right? It has a value in it, but we don't really care. What we're gonna focus on is what happens to these registers as we execute these instructions, as we invoke this function called a foo. Um, ESP, let's say that it's pointing up here. This is the top of our stack. So it's pointing up here somewhere. We now push EAX. So we push that value onto the stack right here, EAX. So ESP, is now pointing right here to this location. Next thing that happens is this call to foo. Call instruction pushes the return address on. So we're gonna increment ESP, ESP is gonna change to here. And now on top of the stack is gonna be our return address. Okay. We're also going to put the address of foo into EIP. So normally, we execute an instruction, EIP just moves to the next instruction. But with a call, we now have a change in that flow, and that we go, EIP points to that location, that address, goes there and starts executing instructions, okay? So we modified the stack, EIP now is here. We're gonna execute instructions for this method foo. Here's our prologue, and here is our epilogue. Okay, so we enter that function. Okay, ESP is pointing here, return address. We still don't really care where EBP is at. We push EBP. Okay, we're going to move, we're going to use EBP. So we, we care about the fact that we want to restore it when we're done. So in this case, we now push. So ESP is going to be pointing right here. And on top of our stack is the old value of EBP. So that's this instruction. Now, this one. So we move e, the value of ESP into EBP. So finally we care about what EBP is doing. EBP is going to have the same value that ESP has. So EBP is going to be pointing here. ESP is pointing right here. This is the top of our stack. We've just set the stack frame. Okay. Arguments, return address, old value of EBP. Right? That's all the stuff that we have set up on the stack that we care about before we start to execute instructions inside of the function. So normally, you might have, you have instructions here. Function is going to do something. ESP is going to get moved. It's going to get changed. Oftentimes, you'll see a sub here, maybe sub ESP8 or whatever the case may be. But odds are, let's back this up a little bit. ESP will be at some point in time pointing down here somewhere else. Okay, EBP is our frame. EBP stays consistent right here. So once we're all done with that, we get to the point where we're done with all these instructions, whatever they may be, we get to the epilogue. So we move EBP into ESP. 
and EBP is pointing to this frame, to the old value of EBP. So ESP no longer points there, and now it points back to where it was, okay, old EBP. So that takes care of that instruction. Pop EBP, top of our stack, old EBP. So now we're moving this value into EBP. So EBP is no longer pointing there. It has the value restored. So whatever it was when before we invoked this function. Okay, and then we return. And this is what's important because when we return, so we did a pop, so not only did we restore EBP, but ESP is now pointing right here. Okay, when we return, we take whatever's on the top of the stack and move that into EIP. So ESP is pointing at our return address. Return address is moved into EIP. Execution now comes right here. Okay. And this is important because if we screwed up anywhere along the way, if our stack got got misaligned, if we didn't, if we didn't have the, the right amount of pushes and pops or whatever we did, if we don't get it so that when the epilog executes, that when we return, the stack is pointed to, ESP is pointed to the top of the stack, and the top of the stack is the return address, we'd have a problem. Right? If it was pointing here, we'd have a problem. If it was pointing here, we'd have a problem because I don't know what value that is. I don't know what address that is. I need to return back to this instruction. And this would likely cause our program to crash, a segmentation fault. Right? And so it's really important that when once this epilogue is ready to execute, that the top of our stack is pointing to this return address. Okay, so we return, everything went correct. We popped the return address off, moved into EIP. We now are back here. So after our function call. Now you'll oftentimes see add ESP and then some value. And what's happening here is that after the function call, and we'll talk about calling conventions a little bit later, is that oftentimes the caller is responsible for cleaning up the stack. Okay, this instruction right here modified the stack. We pushed. We pushed and modified the stack only for this function call. So now that we're done with it, we need to clean up the stack. So we pushed EAX, four bytes. We now need to add to ESP4. Where does ESP point to right now? Let me get a new color here. After that ret, we pop the return address off. That changes ESP. So ESP is pointing right here to the argument. So at this point in time, ESP is pointing to that argument. So add ESP4, we're adding to ESP, higher addresses, lower addresses. So if we add to it, we go to a higher number. So that means ESP points back up here. Where is that? It doesn't really matter. What's, what's important is that we've restored ESP to point to the location that it did before we called this function. Okay. All right, hopefully this makes sense. Um, I've tried to come up with a, a better way of drawing this, and, and this is so far the best I can come up with. Uh, if this was too confusing, please give me some feedback and let me know so that I can try again or uh, maybe come up with a better series of slides or something. But um, hopefully you get the idea, the concept of the stack. In the next video, we'll talk about local variables, and then we'll also get into uh, talking about the stack garb or the stack cookie. So, uh, that's all I have, and I'll talk to you guys in the next video.